When you walked in this morning, in the back of the auditorium, you saw four tables. This is Sanctity of Life Month. Last week was Sanctity of Life Sunday. And we support 40, over 40 different missionaries and ministries. And so what we want to do this morning is to put a spotlight on four, three missionaries that view life as created by God. All of them do. But right here in the Bangor area, we have three ministries that we support that view life as a gift from God. So I want to turn to Psalm 139 very quickly because I want to save time for our interview. Psalm 139 starting in verse 13. You formed me in my inner parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought or created in the depths of the earth. This morning as you walked in, you have the Mansion Church. We interviewed Pastor Terry. They have a church in the city to minister to those that are homeless. In about 30 seconds, you're going to meet Carol Conley, who is the executive director of the Christian Civic League. And his ministry is to help bring in people into office that have a view that life begins at conception and it ends at natural death. And at 11 o'clock, if you would choose to stay, you're going to hear from Barb Ford, our executive director of God Parent Home Ministries, where they minister to women that have pregnancy and have nowhere to go, or they are in abusive situations and they need someplace safe to stay. So this would be the one Sunday you could come to three different services and hear three different messages. So this morning we're going to introduce Carol Conley. So come on up, Carol. He is the executive director of the Christian Civic League. <clears throat> sure, either one. So we're going to sit and we're going to talk and we're going to wait until both of us have nothing to say. So put the crock pot on hold because you might get out of here by 6 o'clock tonight, right? All right, so we have a list of questions and the first service I got through one. So we'll see how this goes. All right, so Carol, tell us about yourself as far as what is the Christian Civic League. And in a moment of vulnerability, I didn't even know we had a Civic League till COVID happened. So there may be some here that don't even know what the Civic League is. So tell us what it is and what you do. Well, the Christian Civic League, if you see our display in the back, our, our mission is bringing a Christian or biblical perspective to public policy. And we've been around since 1897. And uh, so it really predates the uh, movement that started around 1988 when Dr. Dobson, through Focus on the Family, tried to find or start organizations in each state that would lobby on behalf of life, religious freedom, parental rights, biblical values, and so on. So the Christian Civic League is the oldest one of its kind uh, in, in the country. So it actually started up in Fort Fairfield, Maine, with mostly Congregational and Episcopalians at that time in 1897 to address binge drinking, a very serious binge drinking that was going on on the college campuses. It eventually, they came to the conclusion that as you address these issues on a cultural basis, unless you are doing it from a legislative perspective as well, um, and getting people into the legislature, decision makers that are defenders or champions of those values, so eventually uh, got into the for quote unquote political aspect of supporting candidates, training candidates, those type of things. And then in 1973, when Roe v. Wade was became the law of the land, uh, there was a big shift away from substance abuse and sexual purity, not away from, but to also focus upon the life issue. And as, as you mentioned, that's uh, where we, I was at, down in Waldeboro speaking at, on Sanctity of Life last Sunday, and so there's no question of, of the issues that we deal with most uh, significantly these last few years is the, the life issue, uh, human sexuality, of course, with the redefinition of gender and, and sexuality, and then the assault upon uh, religious freedom and parental rights. So uh, those are the probably the main focus areas. So life begins at conception, the LGBTQ movement, and then that that whole 
envelope. How does, what does a typical day look like for you as far as how do you minister, how do you influence legislation? There's a whole, your whole world I don't understand. So help me understand a little bit of what you do. Well, when you consider uh, that there really are two parts of the Christian Civic League, the 501c4, which is, again, the political arm where we actually can lobby, try to influence legislation. So that that part is mainly in Augusta, but I also in, involved with federal issues and going down to Washington, D.C., or meeting with our, our federal representatives here. So that is, uh, as far as the direct lobbying, that's our lobbying team. So Mike McClellan and our policy director, and then we've added a legislative consultant uh, this year with Nick Adolfson. So they are there providing uh, research, and support for those people that are in the legislature and the government that already are with us on those issues, frankly, encouragement as well, uh, helping them uh, with the research on bills that they are either putting forward or bills that, that we're trying to stop. And so the policy team is more directly and publicly involved with that. The last couple of years, my focus have been more on the 501c3, the Christian Education League, which came around in 58, at that time primarily to go into public schools to talk about substance abuse and, and sexual purity. Then, of course, we were no longer welcome in the public schools for, for years. But right now, the focus of the Christian Education League is trying to get pastors uh, to invest in the lives of our elected leaders, not from a policy side and, and not necessarily from, uh, certainly not from a partisan side, but in Romans 13, as you know well, Pastor, there are, there are two shepherds. Mm -hmm. uh, First of all, we have the shepherd that we normally think of, the shepherd of the church, but then we also have that ordained government minister. And that our Bible tells us, just as I have sat in the office of Governor LePage, and I've also sat in the office of Governor Mills, and tell them whether I voted for you or not, my Bible tells me that God ordained you to be the governor of this state, or the representative of this state, or the senator of your district. And so I want you to know that I'm praying for you. I want you to be the best governor that you can be. And we know that government cannot function the way God intended it to unless we have godly people investing in the lives of our leaders. So that's that's the church ambassador network and that's mm -hmm. something that I'm really excited about and that truly is something that works uh, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, this, we, we wouldn't be transparent and honest to say that uh, Politics has been polarized mm -hmm. in the last few years, and, and mainly a lot of that is on the life issue. And so uh, there's no question that the Republican Party is more consistent defender of life, and it's so that a lot of our allies are there, but there are exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. So we work both sides of the aisle. That's bipartisan. But nonpartisan work, trying to get pastors down there and invest in the lives of the leaders so that government can function the way God intended, to reward that which is good and and punish that which is evil so government can be a blessing. It was really interesting. Carol invited me down, I think that was in the summer, as part of a pastoral cohort just to go into the Capitol and to my eyes, like I, I needed a refund in my civic league uh, class when I was in eighth grade because you got to meet these legislators and they are human. They have fears, they have concerns, they have needs and it was just really neat to take time to pray with one or two of them because they have people all around them pulling for them and just saying vote this way or vote that way. It was almost they looked at us going, what do you have to say? I just wanted to pray. That really changed the conversation. And if, just as a testimony to the church and Pastor Tom as well, one of the representatives was a Amy Reeder, who is right mm -hmm. here in Bangor. She was newly elected. And a lot of times with the Democrats, they think, you know, what are you up to? You know, you, you've got an agenda or something like that. And we make it clear. We're there to pray. Mm -hmm. That's why we want to thank you for your public service. And we want to be able to be a resource to you. And she happened to mention to Pastor Tom that she was really interested in the homeless. Mm -hmm. And that 
that she had seen this really neat ministry called the Mansion Church, and she wanted to know, you know, she was hoping that somehow she could find, and did, didn't realize she was actually talking to the pastor uh, that actually, you know, was was the head of that, and or the, the, that funds that and, and, and supports that. And so that's the, those are the type of issues in the church ambassador, like the homeless issue, immigration issue, uh, trying to get the church more involved in foster care, uh, human trafficking, uh, a lot of those. How, what are we going to do about child care? How can the church help the government when we both recognize some of those problems that exist? Now, we will never, ever walk away or dilute our advocacy uh, on the life issue with our policy team and those other more uh, divisive issues. But yet, these are opportunities uh, for us, frankly, to partner with uh, the ministers of the government that we can be a temporal blessing. The government's supposed to be then fine. And of course, as we advocate for those things, we also want to be able to address eternal truths as we uh, establish relationships with them. What's some of the biggest challenges you have right now? Because politics is very divided. There's a, I think there's a strong line. So what are some other challenges that you currently face that you're able to share with? Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, many of you saw uh, two weeks ago when uh, it was clearly stated uh, that there's going to be an attempt to remove the viability standard in our state. And for, for years and years, there has been a compromise between the pro-life and the pro-choice uh, advocates that at least taxpayers wouldn't have to pay for abortion, which went by the board uh, three years ago. We now have tax-funded abortion. But probably the last bastion of that compromise was that you couldn't abort a child in the last trimester. And now they are trying to remove that. That, of course, is a challenge in itself, but the passion and uh, the divisiveness of that issue, uh, the challenge is, is for us to not just be advocates of that truth, but to be effective advocates of that truth. And one of the questions I know you asked us to prepare for was, you know, what is God speaking to you right now, lately? And uh, Matthew, uh, I, can't, I, th I think it's Matthew 18, where we have the parable of the wheat and the tares. And it says that, that a man went into his field and cast, you know, planted weed, and then the enemy came and, and put weeds or tares in it. And the, and the servants came to the master and said, hey, let's just tear up all the wheat right now. And the master said, no, no, that will be in the day of harvest, because in pulling up the weeds, you might actually pull up some of the wheat and some of the, the life-giving aspect of that. And for, for us, we don't know always who the wheat and the tares are, but God does. And so when we advocate for life, it needs to be life-giving, not just temporal life of those innocent babies, but the God of life, the Lord of life, the abundant life that God has promised us. And so even in the advocacy of something that we have such great conviction and great passion, as do our adversaries and our opponents, and by the way, they're not our enemies, mm -hmm. we, the great challenge is to do that in a way that is loving, patient, and respectful, not just that we condemn for someone that is wrong and destructive and not good for our society, both temporally or eternally, but at the same time, we do it in a way to give God the opportunity to draw people to the source of that truth. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, that I don't know if that could be done humanly. Mm -hmm. That has to be done, I believe, supernaturally through the Holy Spirit. We could sit here for hours and talk about all the things that are a struggle or going wrong, can you share with us a victory that you've had? Something, a, a story of testimony of you've seen God work, whether it's through lobbying or legislation. Uh, to share with us a win. Well, uh, for, on, on the legislative side, uh, just very thankful that we've been able to stop the Equal Rights Amendment. And a lot of people say, why in the world would you, you know, are you against equal rights? Of course not. But it's about, again, these two issues that we've been talking about. So in a state that is very, very progressive, we're thankful for that. But if, probably one of the most fulfilling things that happened recently is a very well-known Democratic leader. Uh, his family was actually attacked, uh, but frankly, by Republicans because of substance uh, abuse issue in his family. 
uh, with one of his children. And I, it was just disgusting to me that it happened. And I remember reaching out to this individual once privately when we didn't even know each other. But I saw him in the hallway. And that started a relationship where even though we still had great differences and still do, it started a relationship where the next year after this person and I actually got together to work together on some bills and he actually helped me with folks on the other side of the aisle. I got a phone call uh, from him when I was down south once and he just said, hey, I just wanted to call you and let you know it was Easter. He said, I'm walking out of the church for the first time probably in over 10 years. Wow. And I want you to know the reason I'm walking out of church is because of my relationship with you. And so I, I praise God for that. When I get a phone call, uh, and I look down and I see someone that is not an ally in any way, shape, or form and calling and saying, Carol, I didn't know who else to call because um, I have a prayer request. Someone is very, very sick that's dear to me and so on. Um, that's really, that's what God has called us to do. And I don't think my job's any different than yours. God's called us to be advocates for his truth. All of it. Now, there are times the world's going to pat us on the back and say, you go for civil rights, church. You, you go for, and go against slavery, and they'll pat us on the back. But when we talk about things that they hold so dear in regard to their rebellion, by the way, the same rebellion that we were in at one time, they don't welcome that. But that doesn't change whether we should be advocates. But the purpose of that advocacy goes beyond the absolutely true, recognizable temporal values of a, of a c culture that lines up with God's values. But we always have to remember whether it's at the bubbler at work or whether it's at our family table or whether it happens to be in the public square sitting in the governor's office. We're advocates for God's truth so people will be drawn to the source of that truth. And that can only be done when we, have, when we look at that opponent the same way that God does. Hmm. What are some ways we can partner with you? Well, this church, my home church, uh, someone asked me uh, before the service where I go to church. Um, believe it or not, I do go here. Not, not very often. You just led music at 8 <laughs> yeah, o'clock. Yeah, 8 o'clock. That's right. But I'm usually speaking at other churches. But I just want to say... You folks are so incredibly supportive. You're so supportive financially. There are so many people sitting in these services that are individually, financially supportive of the league. And, you know, it's, it's a big ministry. It's uh, thirty-five dollars to $45,000 a month that we have wow. to raise, depending upon the year and our activities. And that, that's one of the hardest things and, frankly, one of the least fun uh, things that I have to do. And I feel like Jerry Falwell sometime. You know, we just had a tremendous year-end campaign, $125,000 in December, praise the Lord. And now in February, I wrote another letter that we've got to raise $50,000 you know, for our legislative campaign. Um, so pray that the Lord would give us the resources that are necessary. And, and again, I know you do this, and it sounds like the thing to say, but um, I've been here since 1992. And some of you know that if I'd been called to this ministry in 92, it would have been a disaster. Um, the Christians civically didn't need anybody that had all the answers or that could tear someone's head off in a debate or anything like that. Um, that competitive uh, spirit um, is something that is always in me, you know, was bred into me, you know, uh, in, in my family. Please pray that the Christian Civic League would be seen just for what we said it was, that we won't be overcome with discouragement, that we won't be overcome uh, with frustration. And it's one thing to look at something and understand that it's morally wrong and destructive, but never from a position of moral superiority, that our motivation is our love for God and our love for our neighbor wherever they are. And that is that is how you can best pray for us. I'd highly recommend you stop at our display on the way back uh, so you can connect with us Absolutely. with our uh, email blast that go out Thursday and as always check out our website cclmaine.org and especially as we go into this legislative session it's going to be hot and heavy it's, uh, so to, to know what's going on when you have an opportunity it's one thing for my lobbyists to be running around and saying things but it's you it's your voice you being a steward and leveraging your voice for truth that makes the greatest impact